Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm, this is kind of the highlight of my year. Uh, Buzzwords is my favorite conference. Uh, we were just, I was just talking to Simon. I was one of the people that stood up yesterday when Isabel asked you know, how many people had been at the first one. I've been at, at every one since then. Uh, I've actually spoken at every, every Buzzword since then. Though this is my first keynote, Buzzwords or otherwise, so um, take solace in knowing if I screw this up, no one will be more upset than me. Um, and, I, and I do want to thank you all for showing up this morning. Uh, I had a little trepidation of my own that this is, you know, maybe is a bit off topic and will seem a little weird for a, for a tech conference. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's pretty safe to, to say that you know, we all spend a, a great deal of time in front of our computers, and uh, there are some health risks associated with that, and I think we could, we could do with raising the awareness a bit. Um, before I get started, I do want to make it absolutely clear that I am not a doctor. I'm not a, a medical professional of any kind. I don't even play one on television. Um, I'm going to tell a story, my story, of of the troubles I've had with repetitive stress injury, and in doing so, I kind of invariably have to talk about uh, symptoms and diagnosis and treatment and you know, maybe a little bit about workstation ergonomics. But you shouldn't take any of that home with you as, you know, as, as information you should act on. Um, the only thing I would hope you, you would take home with you is that uh, you should go get medical advice and then, and then follow it. So uh, every story has a beginning. I'm choosing to set mine in the year 2000. Uh, it's a bit arbitrary. It certainly doesn't represent when I first started using computers. Um, but prior to 2000, it would have been more or less as a secondary tool for work and school and as a hobby. Uh, 2000 is a nice epoch for me because it's when I got my, my very first job at a, at a tech startup. Um, 15 years is a long time in this industry, and a, and a lot has changed. But I think, you know, what it, what it means to work at a startup is, has remained largely the same. So uh, just to sort of, you know, set the scene, uh, you know, we had a small group of, small group of uh, you know, relatively young, energetic people, uh, you know, a group that was very much believed in the mission. You know, true believers would be a good way to describe us. We had a bit of money. But in those early days of a startup, you know, that's viewed as runway, and that runway gets a bit shorter every day. You have these really concrete sort of milestones you have to reach by a certain period of time before you can kind of move on, um, before you become, you know, established. Uh, this kind of fuels this sense of urgency, this, uh, this need to, to get things done to do whatever it takes. You know, everybody wears multiple hats. Everyone's a, you know, basically on call. Um, it kind of results in this culture of heroics. Um, for me personally, though, that, what, what overshadowed that was just the, sh the amount of fun I had. It was, it was kind of the right place at the right time for me. Um, it, I would characterize it as, as you know, like the, most, the thing that stuck out to me the most was what they would let me do. You know, uh, Anywhere else, you know, an established company, I would have been seen, deemed as too junior or, or not having the right background for, you know, a good many of these projects. Uh, but all I needed was a can-do attitude, and, uh, and they would let me, you know, they would let me work on things. On top of that, you know, they let me do crazy out-of-the-box thinking. So uh, I just had so much fun. I learned so much. Uh, a typical day for me, you know, I would bounce out of, the bed, out of bed in the morning, just super excited to get started, which is a good way to be. And I would show up, you know, strictly earlier than I needed to, um, often before anyone else. I would work long, uninterrupted hours. Uh, in those early days, you know, we had lunch catered in, and so I didn't even need to suffer the interruption to get something to eat. I could just drag a plate back to my desk. And I would work into the evening, and oftentimes I would go home and I would work some more. Um, you know, I'd work through the weekends. I would pull all-nighters. Um, I loved holidays. A holiday for me is when everyone else took a holiday because then the office was empty and I could just get, a, I could get so much done. Um, and it, I'd like to think that I have a good work ethic, but that's not what this was. Um, I would have told you at the time I was a hacker. This is what I did. This is the things I thought about. 
Um, having this job, all it really did was afford me the, the luxury of thinking about it you know, full time without worrying about how I was going to put food on the table. And all of this kind of uh, fit in well with this, you know, this early stage of the startup, this culture of heroics. It just looked like I was you know, really pulling for the team. Um, I think that initial, initial super intense period of a startup usually is pretty, pretty finite, pretty short. Either you fail, and you know, let's, let's admit it, most startups do, or you succeed and more resources become available and more people are hired and there's less pressure on that initial group. Um, around this time, though, is when we had that first big crash in tech, you know, that bursting of the bubble. And I think it, this being the first time this happened, I think there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of skepticism that, that it would ever recover. And so while we were doing really well, uh, you know, investor confidence was, was, so, far, was so down that uh, it kind of cast doubt on our future. So we did something very unusual for, for such an early stage startup, for such a young company. We became profitable and we did it by just sheer hard work, just sheer force of will. We doubled down, we did even more from less. So two years on, if anything, it's just gotten more intense for me. And the first few cracks started to show. I started to get some pain in my, in my hands, in my wrist, and my forearms. I started to get uh, some numbness and tingling in my fingers, and this would have been you know, the fingers on the inside of my hands, so the thumb, index finger, and maybe to a lesser degree the ring finger. Um, occasionally, from time to time. Um, I could always correlate it to recent activity. I could say, well, I just came off an all-nighter, or I just put in a you know, particularly hard week to get something launched on time. Um, I could always correlate it with recent events, and that, unfortunately, kind of fueled this denial that, uh, that it wasn't anything to worry about, that, um, that, you know, that, that, it, that it was just a you know, simple... Uh, a simple case of overwork or, or, or strain, you know, that, that, that was fine. I'd go home, I'd take a nice long weekend or something, stay away from the keyboard, and I would feel better, and that reinforced this. I don't really know what, what I was thinking back then, but I had this real sense of, of I don't know, denial that uh, I felt as if this didn't apply to me, that, you know, repetitive stress injuries were something that happened to other people, and that this wasn't something I needed to worry about, or at least not right now. It just, it just couldn't make it a priority. Um, and so this sort of episodic nature just helped me kind of dismiss it as, oh, that's it's nothing. Obviously, I feel better. It must be okay. Uh, but another year down the road, and the pain is getting a little worse. So is the numbness and tingling. Uh, it's now joined by neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain. I'm getting some pretty bad headaches. Um, and it's becoming often. It's no longer, you know, episodic. I can no longer correlate it to any, any given activity. It's actually becoming kind of constant. Um, and I'm kind of ashamed to say that, uh, that uh, what really got me, what made me decide to go, to go see a doctor wasn't out of fear of what I was doing to my body. It was uh, that it was getting in the way of things. It was, you know, it was interfering with my, with, with my output and I, for some reason, I still thought I would go to the doctor and everything would just be, you know, it would just be something simple. Uh, so I went to see my primary care physician, the doctor I see for, you know, most things. Um, and I was right. It was a very short visit. She wanted, to, uh, she wanted to know what the symptoms were. She made note of what I did for a living and promptly referred me to an orthopedic hand surgeon who specializes in occupational injuries. Uh, that's not a diagnosis, but it made it pretty obvious what she was thinking. So I, I called to set up an appointment with this hand surgeon, and they have a few questions, you know, like, what do you do for a living? What are your symptoms? And they wouldn't even see me. They wouldn't even put me on the calendar until I first got a uh, nerve conduction study from a neurologist. Now, a nerve conduction study is a, a diagnostic procedure that's used to determine whether or not you have carpal tunnel syndrome, which is sort of the poster child for for repetitive stress injuries. So I still didn't have a diagnosis, but it was pretty obvious what they were thinking. Um, before I explain what the nerve conduction study is, let me tell another story. I'll take a small aside, I promise to circle back around. Um, I spent the, the latter years of my teens 
uh, living in the city of El Paso, Texas. So for those of you who are not familiar with U.S. geography, which I assume is everyone here from the U.S., um, El Paso is a city in West Texas. It's very, very remote, out in the middle of the desert. Um, if you think of the sort of stereotypical idea of, of a desert in the U.S. Southwest, you know, cactuses, sagebrush, tumbleweeds, nothing but sand, that's it exactly. But it is a border community. So if you look at El Paso from the air, it looks like this, this one big city with a river running through the middle of it, when in fact everything north of that river is the U.S., it's El Paso, and every, everything south of that river is the city of Juarez in Mexico. So uh, everything north of that river has a drinking age of 21, everything south, 18. Uh, so it follows if you're a, a teenager living in, in El Paso, and it's hot, and it's boring, and all you have to do is walk across the bridge into Juarez to buy beer like everyone else, that that's what you're going to do. And it wasn't just me. Thousands of American teenagers flocked there every Friday and Saturday night, uh, making that place very, very strange. Uh, it was strange. I think it was strange precisely because it was filled with hammered American teenagers. Um, they had this guy who would go around from bar to bar, club to club, with this device called a uh, caja de tocas, which I think translates to something like box of shocks or box of electrical shocks. Um, th this is what a Google image search says this looks like. That's not what I remember. This, I, this thing looks very, I don't know, manufactured. What I remember uh, looked like it was cobbled together out of bits and pieces of household appliances. I, I distinctly remember a bare transformer kind of haphazardly screwed to a piece of scrap plywood with just bare wires everywhere. Um, not the sort of thing that you, you know, synonymous with safety. But this man would set up at a booth or a table and people would line up to sit opposite of him and crucially pay him money like a dollar or something so that they could pick up these electrodes and let the man shock them. Um, I would love to tell you what the point of this is, what, you know, what this is all about. The truth is, I have no idea. I used to think it was maybe, you know, like some contest because the man would turn the knob up as this, as this went through, and, uh, and of course they would writhe and twist and twitch, and it was just this grotesque spectacle. Uh, then he would announce the number at the end, and, and everyone would cheer. But they cheered no matter what. They cheered no matter what the number was, and nobody seemed to be keeping track of it, so... I really don't think it was a contest. Now, to put this in further context, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, let's say, 18, 18 years of age. And like most males of our species, I have peaked. I have reached my peak. By that, I mean I'm at peak stupidity. <laughs> at no point prior in my life, or at no point since, have I been more stupid than I was right then. And on top of this, I'm drinking. Alcohol makes everybody stupid, so it's, you know, it's compounded stupidity. Um, if there was ever a window of time, ever a period when you could convince me to do something heinously stupid, this was it. And uh, many people succeeded. But I never once participated in this, this whole ritual of the Caja de Tocas. Uh, in fact, I sat back in sort of, you know, righteous condemnation, just you know, shaking my head. Um, and it's stuck with me all of these years. It's, for me, it's kind of rule number one. It's, you know, you do not pay someone to electrocute you. <laughs> Everything after that's optional. So what does this have to do with the nerve conduction study? It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. It's really, it's right in the name. Nerve conduction. The nerves are yours, thus you are the conductor. And what we are conducting is electricity. Um, it's all wrapped up in a much tidier uh, package. Uh, if you look at this picture, you know, we can see the sharps container and the gloves dispensers mounted to the wall behind. Our patient, this uh, gentleman here in the foreground, he's, he appears to be sitting on an exam table. Um, this woman is clearly the neurologist, and she's got her scrubs on. She looks very professional. She looks, you know like a medical professional. Even the equipment looks a little bit better. Um, what we can see of it, it's, a, it's attached to a laptop computer, so it's gotta be legit. 
Uh, but make no mystery about it, this guy's about to get popped. And uh, when he does, he's probably going to come flying up off this table. When he lands and his heart is racing and his breathing is shallow and rapid, I, I suspect he'll be contemplating the stupidity that, that led him to directly or indirectly be you know, paying this woman to, to shock him. Uh, but there is a method to this madness, and I think you know, it, it helps to understand what carpal tunnel syndrome is. So uh, the carpal tunnel is this, this area here at the base of your palm. It's like a very you know, narrow little opening through which all of the tendons and the, the nerves and the blood vessels traverse, and it's all, everything's kind of held in place with this carpal ligament. Um, through repetitive motion of your, of your fingers and your hand, and through repetitive motion of these, these tendons, this fluid-filled sheath, which is shown here in dark blue, can become inflamed and, uh, you know, it swells and makes that, that already compact area much more compact and, and, you know, it builds pressure within there and that can impinge the blood flow and can impinge the nerves. Uh, the body is very flexible and, you know, of course you can heal from this, you will heal from this, but in doing so, a little scar tissue is formed and then, you know, it's formed within that carpal tunnel and uh, so it makes, makes it a little tighter and makes it a little easier for that to happen, you know, uh, Subsequently, uh, you know, eventually you have so much scar tissue in there that it's, you know, it's very difficult for that inflammation, inflammation to go down and, you know, it just becomes sort of the new normal. Uh, so the, the nerve conduction study is, you know, it's transmitting an electrical current down your arm, measuring, the, you know, the response or the output at your fingers to look for that, that uh, impingement of the nerve. In my case, the median nerve would explain the, the numbness in the, the fingers on the inside of my hand. Uh, so, my nerve conduction study uh, resulted in a diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome, which I guess at this point is not terribly surprising. And with this diagnosis, I was able to, to finally go see this, this hand surgeon. There were a few things that were surprising in that initial visit. Uh, perhaps first and foremost was, even though he is a hand surgeon, the majority of what he does is, is an, an attempt to avoid hand surgery. Uh, to address the root causes and uh, to see if he can't get you better without, without surgery. Uh, the surgery is a sort of weapon of, of last resort. Um, another of the, the more surprising things that came out of that visit is I never mentioned to him any of those other symptoms, the, the headache, uh, back aches, neck pain, shoulder pain, never, never brought any of that up. And yet he, he began talking about it as if it was, you know, uh, just a matter of fact, as if as if he had known all along. And this is, I guess, when I kind of realized that I was not a unique and special snowflake. Um, he explained that, you know, these, that, that, that essentially uh, these, these behaviors, this activity, and, and you know, particularly when you're not, you're not you know, adhering to the, the correct posture and ergonomics, um, it results in some very, fairly standard set of symptoms and injuries, and typically it's more than just, you know, uh, you know, pain in your hands. The body is a system, everything is connected, and so generally this sort of abuse and stress and strain uh, affects, you know, many parts of your body. Uh, he set in motion a number of things that day, uh, the first of which was the work site evaluation. So what this is, is you have a, a physical therapist who also has a specialty in occupational injuries, comes out to wherever it is you work, kind of sits off to the side, watches you do your thing, takes some notes, and then pulls you, pulls you off to the side and tells you what it is you're doing wrong. Uh, most importantly, why these wrong things are causing you, you pain, you know, creating injuries. They, uh, they tell you what it is you should be doing. They give you a set of good behaviors, uh, some stretching exercises, stressing the importance of breaks, and they help you set up your workstation. So you know, the height of everything, the angle of everything, relationship of all of the pieces. And again, most importantly, with explanations as to why this is good or why this is better. Uh, I was given physical therapy. I think this was something like two, three times a week for something like four to six weeks. There were a variety of things done in there, some of which I just, to this day, I don't really understand. Ultrasound therapies were supposed to have some impact on the nerves, but I never really quite understood why. Uh, there was a fair amount of like what seemed like massage therapy, 
And I think that was about breaking up some of the scar tissue in that, in that region and loosening, loosening up the tissues. There's also a lot of strength training, a lot of resistance uh, training. Um, I also started diagnostic injections. Man, these things are fun. Uh, it's not an intravenous injection, it's steroids. They put it right into that carpal tunnel area. Uh, when you look at the injection, and you look at the volume of fluid and you're thinking, you know, conservation of mass, I don't think that's going to all fit in there. <laughs> when he starts pressing, you know, pressing on the plunger, and for some reason he's got to push really hard, you know, he's got to, he's got to bear down into it, then it really feels like it's not going to fit all in there. Um, the expectation is this, this, this may make you feel better in the days and weeks to come, but the intention is not to make you feel better for the sake of it. Um, he puts this injection in a different place each time and then asks you to, uh, you know, to, to detail, you know, take detailed notes and report back to him, you know, what relief you had. And so he can kind of build up a map of what's going on inside your hand based on what, you know, what areas give you relief. There's also a, a diminishing return to these injections. So every subsequent injection, you know, the dose gets a little bigger to, to compensate for this. And... Uh, yeah, you thought it was bad the first time, but the last time, you know, my hand was just black and blue. It was really bad. Um, yeah, good times. I also started taking anti-inflammatories. Uh, we tried a, a number of different things, ended up settling on uh, NSAIDs like you'd buy over the counter, naproxen or ibuprofen, although in significantly higher doses than what the, the bottle recommends, prescription level doses. And this was all day, you know, every day, several times a day for weeks and months. Probably the least surprising thing is I was sent home with splints. I'd already been thinking about how I was going to explain that fashion choice. But uh, it was my doctor's opinion that, that there was little value in wearing these around during the day and while you work, so long as you're, you know, you're maintaining the right you know, uh, positioning and posture. Uh, he just wanted me to wear them at night to keep from sleeping on them, you know, impinging that nerve further at night. So I, uh, I followed all the directions, did everything that was asked of me. By this point, I'm taking it fully seriously. I no longer believe that, uh, that this is not, you know, this is something I don't need to worry about. Uh, I, I do, in fact, believe at this point that it affects me as well. And so a year later, uh, by 2004, I was doing much better. Um, the carpal tunnel syndrome in my right hand was significantly worse than my left, but it, you know, in my left it had reached a point where I would call it you know, manageable. It, it was good if I, if I did what I was supposed to. Uh, headaches, back aches, neck pain, all of that was pretty much gone at this point. Um, and the right hand, the worst of the two hands, is much improved, but not, not, not fully better. Still a lot of numbness and tingling. And you don't want to let that go unchecked because... Uh, uh, that can result in nerve damage, and the nerve damage results in some pretty uh, debilitating disfigurements of the hand. So you definitely got to uh, stay on top of that. So uh, at this point, we elected to have surgery, surgery on the right hand. The surgery for this is actually uh, remarkably simple. They just sever that uh, transverse carpal ligament, that band that kind of holds everything in place. Uh, they make like a zigzag incision, and then the expectation is it'll heal a little longer than, than what it was to begin with and, and relieve some of that pressure in there. Um, there came with some restrictions after the surgery, you know, limits on how much I could lift and, you know, how much gripping of things I could do and stuff. Ironically, the one thing I could do when I went home, and I did, was sit in front of the keyboard and type. As long as I could deal with the thick surgical dressing, I could go home and type. I thought that was very strange. Um, after the surgery, I had more physical therapy. This seemed more geared, geared towards uh, recovery from the surgery than the first bit, so it was less of that resistance training. Uh, so then fast forward to 2011. Surgery worked pretty good. My right hand is now my good hand. Everything's is good there. Everything... Everything else is essentially manageable at this point. Uh, but in 2011, I started to have some more numbness and tingling in my fingers. This time, it's, it's on the fingers on the outside of my hands, though, so the, the pinky 
the ring finger. Um, you know, I go back to the doctor right away. Again, I no longer think that that uh, that, that I can avoid this. You know, that I that it, that it doesn't apply to me. And I get a diagnosis of cubital tunnel syndrome. Uh, kind of messes up the whole acronym CTS. You know, everyone says CTS. There's like two of them. Uh, cubital tunnel syndrome, though, is an impingement of a different nerve. It's an impingement of the ulnar nerve, which explains the different fingers going numb. And it's an impingement at the elbow. Uh, how I got this is, you know, quite possibly is it was the result of some, some, you know, some damage already done prior to this. You know, I was reminded by my doctor that, you know, that's, that the abuse that had led up to me being treated for carpal tunnel syndrome probably did, it, did other damage as well. But I had also started to get quite lazy and lax on my ergonomics in, the, in that window sense. And one of the things I had done is started to have the, the, the armrests on my chair creep upward to the point where as I was typing, I had my weight, you know, I had the weight of my arms down on top of the, of the armrest. So I was applying pressure, and that's kind of notorious for this. So in addition to getting my ergonomics fixed, getting back on track with that, uh, I was given splints again to wear again at night. Um, prevent you from sleeping with your, your elbows bent and, and impinging the nerve while you sleep. Um, the options for surgery for this are, are much more limited. They're uh, uh, less, less lower success rate with the surgery. It's more complicated, more invasive, takes longer to rec recover from. So uh, you have to be pretty bad to get surgery for this one. Um, I still kind of have a problem with this from time to time. I'll get the numbness and tingling, and I'll have to remember to put my splints on at night, sleep with my arms straight. So then fast forward to earlier this year. Uh, I started to get some pain, again, this time in my, uh, on the outer portion of my forearm, around where it connects to the elbow. I went to the doctor, and I get this diagnosis that I can't pronounce. But they call it mouse elbow or tennis elbow. There's actually a lot of activities that are really susceptible to this. Carpenters get it from swinging a hammer. Um, and of course, you know, those of us who sit behind a keyboard all day can get it from, from using the mouse. It's sort of a strain on this uh, tendon that connects the extensor muscles and forearm to the elbow. Uh, how I got this is probably, again, you know, it may have been something I had been courting for years. Um, I had also, again, started to become slack in the intervening years and with respect to the height and distance of where the mouse was relative to the keyboard and, you know, palm rests and arm rests, I was, I was getting a, a little playing it a little fast and loose again. I was also killing a lot of zombies around this time. Uh, you know, in addition to my daily workload, I, I, you know, I was killing a fair amount of zombies, and of course that requires a little extra. So in addition to getting my, uh, my ergonomics back on track and killing a few, few less zombies, I, uh, I started taking some anti-inflammatories again, uh, and I was given this brace, another, another fashion choice I had to explain to people sort of a band with a, a little plastic nodule that sits over that, that area, I think the intent of which is to kind of, kind of give you some additional support. So then, fast forward today, to today. Um, as of today, I would say I'm you know, more or less healthy. I feel like I've never quite been the same since, you know, since, since this got to the point that I had to go to the doctor the first time. Um, even more, more so than what I mentioned during the timeline, I have kind of, you know, from you know, quite often sort of gotten lax on the, on the, you know, on taking breaks, on the stretching exercises, or, you know, kind of allowed my ergonomics to, to go out of, outside of, you know, protocol. And I'm usually reminded with some, some old pain, and then I, you know, I get back on track, and then everything's fine. Um, feels like it's just kind of under the surface. I know I have been able to maintain a pretty good, uh, pretty good pace. You know, I work you know, a good number of hours, a fair number of hours, though I do know my limitations these days. Um, I'm able to put in a you know, very full week and do so relatively comfortable, but I have to, you know, I really have to kind of stay on top of things. Uh, I, don't, I don't seem to have much wiggle room anymore. So let's, uh, let's step back a little bit, take some retrospectives, see what we can learn from all of this. Um, 
the main thing for me, like the main takeaway of everything that I had, you know, the, every, every bit of assistance I got from, from medicine, the one thing that, that, you know, hands down, I wouldn't trade away was that worksite evaluation. Uh, this is essentially just, you know, a couple of hours of, 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 my, of, of my time. Nothing was done to me. It was entirely knowledge transfer. Um, but I got more relief in just, you know, in just the, the subsequent few days than any other single, you know, treatment or, or procedure, you know, ever gave. And the one thing I, I sort of credit with, you know, allowing me to continue to follow my passions all these years, uh, you know, are these, you know, is essentially what I had, what I learned. And when I fall off the wagon, when I, when I fail to, uh, to follow this, it's, you know, it's returning to this, this set of protocols that, that, that puts me back on track. Um, the main takeaway I, I got from this, you know, again, don't go home and practice ergonomics based on anything you heard here. But I've, the thing I found that, you know, that, that kind of resonated with everything that they taught me was this kind of this idea of you know remaining balanced or anatomically neutral when you work? Uh, you know we're kind of vertical structures. You know uh, you know we're we're best adapted to supporting our own weight and our own stresses. You know in the vertical, and so when we when we you know leave that that vertical when we're leaning you know forward or backward, which is which seems very very common. Um, you know we have to hold ourselves in that position. Our weight is distributed poorly. Um, you know, days or, you know, you know, occasionally this isn't an issue, but when it's, you know, week after week, month after month, um, it can really take its toll. The, the strength training that, that, I, that I, I mentioned in the physical therapy was precisely to, to, to deal with this. It was very targeted, very focused, you know, at, at it was meant to, to develop the muscles that had been, that would counteract or balance out the muscles that I had developed from, you know, sitting hunched over, for example, for years on end, uh, to restore that, that that kind of balance. You know, that this this theme of you know anatomically neutral, uh, you know, pertains to the the, the you know the rather co uh, common wisdom of keeping your wrist straight when you type. Um, if you go back to that diagram of the hand, that carpal tunnel is right there at the base of the palm. If you if you bend your wrist while you're typing, you're occluding that opening. It's like pinching a garden hose. You know, uh, everything needs to move freely through there, and you're creating a lot of additional pressure. So you make that that irritation and, and the subsequent formation of scar tissue uh, all the more likely when you type with your wrist bent. You know, straight is kind of the anatomical, anatomically neutral position for that, where everything moves freely. Uh, me, I committed every sin in the book. You know, I was never upright, never balanced, never anatomically neutral. You know, I was always leaning on one armrest or, you know, uh, leaned back or leaned forward. I mean, this is, this is like very, this is very common with a laptop. Uh, you could probably look around and see a few people staring down at their screens now and they're all hunched over. Let's see, uh, see a few, few people like suddenly went upright when I said that. Yeah, I mean, with a laptop, with the screen fixed to the, you know, to the keyboard like that, it's very hard not to, to hunch over it like, a, like it's your precious. Um, and I don't know, for me, even now, you know, the, the more intensely I get into whatever it is I'm doing, for some reason, the closer I need to get my face to that screen and the more I'm hunched over, I have to remember not to do that. I also laughed at this one. Because I, I, I used to do this a lot. Whenever I wasn't, you know, super intense, deep hack mode, well, you know, hovered over the screen, I was doing this. He's, he's not doing it right, though. The right way is to get your feet kicked up on an overturned trash bin or a subwoofer. And then you can scoot all the way in to where the desk's, like, right up in your armpits. So this is kind of the conventional wisdom. And again, you know... Uh, it's just to demonstrate this idea of, you know, of everything being balanced and neutral. You know, if you, if you look at this, the monitor is such a height that, that she doesn't have to hold, you know, hold her head down or up. You know, she can, she can have her head balanced on her neck, you know, that nice vertical structure that's uh, well, well suited for supporting the weight and just look straight forward at the screen. 
Uh, you know, her torso is upright, so that weight is all distributed in the vertical. Got a little lumbar support there. Legs bent to 90, knees bent to 90, feet flat on the floor, so everything is, you know, the weight is as evenly distributed as possible. Uh, her arms dangle straight down at her sides, and then with the elbows bent to 90 and her wrists straight, the keyboard is right there. It's all, it's all meant, you know, to, to distribute their weight evenly and across, you know, the structures of our body that are they're most adapted to, to supporting them and just, you know, as, as anatomically neutral as you could, you could be. So uh, over the years, I, you know, I, you know I've, I've, really, I've really elevated this worksite evaluation, you know, to, you know it's to being the thing, you know, the, the, the thing I credit with being able to continue to, to follow my passions through, you know, through the, the intervening years. Um, but I, I more recently believe that I've been looking at this, this wrong. Um, when I got my worksite evaluation, it set quite a precedent you know, in, in, you know, where I was working. Um, no one had ever seen that before. And, you know, sat in a, you know, big open area, uh, kind of war room style. And, uh, and so it was kind of unavoidable that everybody, you know, everybody saw this going on and they were very curious and, you know, tried very hard to, to not be obvious about staring. And it was kind of embarrassing, I guess. But uh, our human resource manager uh, also noticed this, and she pulled aside the, the physical therapist and got contact information and arranged for everybody to get one of these uh, worksite evaluations if they, if they wanted. I knew that. What I didn't know was how many people actually took them up on that. Um, in particular, how many people who took them up on that were just people who were, who were sitting around me and, and wondering what was going on that day. It's only been in recent years uh, you know, when I meet up with a, with a past coworker at a conference or something or over beers, you know, we start reminiscing about the old days, as old people tend to do. And, uh, you know, this, this subject will come up. Oh, I remember when you had your worksite evaluation, and uh, that prompted me to get one of my own. And, and then they go on to, in the same way I do, to credit it with keeping them healthy and allowing them to, to follow their passions all these years. Um, the difference, though, is that for them, it was proactive. For me, it was reactive. And obviously, it is so much better to avoid getting these kinds of injuries um, than it is to deal with them after the fact. Um, and I took a little solace in knowing, you know, that, uh, that at least my bad example and my bad experiences may have helped some others avoid those, those same, some of those same mistakes. Uh, and so that's kind of, you know, the genesis of this talk. That's why I wanted to come do it. Um, I, th I think that attitude that this is, you know, this isn't something that, you know, we need to worry about or uh, it's something that doesn't pertain to us, I think it's a far more common than we all like to admit. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it's, it's really important, you know, your, your health is important. If you're to continue to do this for decades on end, uh, it's important that you be healthy and that you're able to do it comfortably. So, uh, again, if you take anything away from this, I would, I would hope that it would be when you go home, whatever form this takes, you know, whether they call it a worksite evaluation or, or something else, find an expert um, and follow their advice because I think it would, it would definitely be worth it. Uh, so thank you. <laughs>